Hi, in this video I'd like to discuss how we can use evolutionary ecology as a reliable path toward understanding what constitutes a natural fire regime for any given forest type. Because most fire scientists are not ecologists, this approach gets little attention in conferences or in the fire literature. But to paraphrase Dobzhansky, who famously said, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, I say nothing about fire makes sense except in the light of evolution. Let's start with the two broad fire regime categories. The infrequent high to mixed severity fire regimes, which occur in forest types that burn at least to some extent into the tree canopy, and the frequent low severity fire regimes, which occur in the more open grown dry forest types, where crown fire is thought to be absent. The ecological approach to understanding which fire regime occurs naturally in any particular vegetation type is to ask the plants and animals which one must have been the backdrop against which they evolved. It's as simple as that. We wrote about this approach some dozen years ago about how evolutionary ecology can provide the powerful route toward understanding historical fire regimes. Basically, the organisms that live in each forest type carry adaptations. Adaptations reflect a long evolutionary history with their respective forest type. So organisms carry signs of that history. Take this example. Adult beetles in the genus Melanophila depend on the presence of large swaths of burned standing dead trees upon which they lay eggs that develop into wood munching larvae. They would not have evolved the ability to detect heat with infrared sensors from a distance of 50 miles if heat intense crown fire weren't part of their environment. Forest types that harbor native populations of these kinds of species are clearly forest types that have a significant severe fire component. So where are these conifer forests in the West? Those forest types are distributed largely where the Forest Service has mapped forests at risk from, quote, bad insects like wood boring beetles. And it's basically the central to northern Rockies around and down through the Sierras. In other words, wood boring beetle distribution maps reveal that most forested land in the western United States supports fire regimes with a significant severe fire component. Or how about the blackback woodpecker? Look at that blackback. Amazing. This is a bird that also depends on burned, standing dead trees because they specialize on eating the larvae of those beetles we just talked about. Our own survey data collected from what now constitute more than 20,000 points scattered across northern Idaho and western Montana show that the blackback woodpecker occurs in burn forests to the near exclusion of any other vegetation type or condition. As I once wrote, I believe it would be difficult to find a forest bird species more restricted to a single vegetation cover type in the northern Rockies than the blackback woodpecker is to early post-fire conditions. Indeed, the only way a species could be restricted to a single forest condition is if it evolved in the presence of that condition for a very long time. Everything about this bird screams fire. Its pure black coloration would not have evolved in the absence of a blackened tree trunks against which they are amazingly cryptic while they forage for these unique beetle larvae. If this species shows up in large numbers along with jewel beetles within a year or so following fire, then you're probably looking at a forest type that just experienced not only just experienced severe fire, but one that historically harbored patches of severe crown fire as part of its fire regime. The distribution of this species also reflects a distribution of severe fire, certainly throughout the boreal forests of Canada, but also significantly down through the Rockies and on over and down through the Sierras. And morel mushrooms wouldn't evolve to grow exclusively in severely burned mixed conifer forests unless severe fire regime weren't part of the forest system. As Larson and others discuss in recent paper on that species, they show the distribution of fire morels in burned forests show they occur exclusively where it is toasty toasty. Right here. 
Look at them. When the percent of the plot burned is 100%, when it's totally toast, you get a ton of morels. And there have been more and more calls recently for these kinds of trait-based studies. These are analyses that seek to understand why organisms have the physical traits they do, like the thick bark illustrated here. You see the quarter? Why do you think some conifers have evolved such thick bark? You can plot the conditions where plants with different bark thicknesses occur worldwide. And as Palsas showed in a recent publication, the pattern of bark thickness varies with fire regime. Plants like Douglas fir in the previous slide have thick bark all the way up the tree, which is a good indication that its historical fire regime was not a surface fire, but a regime that included some crown fire. If fires were historically frequent and mild, then natural selection couldn't favor individuals with thick bark because everyone survives. It takes severe fire to kill most individuals and leave only those with thick bark to survive and produce offspring harboring similar traits. I hope some of these dramatic adaptations of plants and animals make it clear that severely burned forest patches comprise important land conditions across most forest types throughout the West. We need to dump the dogmatic viewpoint that fire is undesirable or unnatural when it produces large swaths of standing dead trees and concentrate instead on keeping our communities safe so we can let fires create the burn forest conditions that they always have. Thanks for listening and join me next time for another fire ecology story. Mm -hmm.